imagine a place older than time itself where ancient people lived in canyons and mined large caves for chert to create weapons and tools. A place where waterfalls and amazing beauty surround you like the Garden of Eden. Secluded and only accessible if you're willing to walk into the woods. Imagine a place where high up, beautiful views let you see for miles or incredible caves deep within the earth are waiting to be toured. Both ruins and ghost towns await those that seek an unparalleled journey of exploration. This is the incredible hidden world of Crawford County, Indiana. For a fact, if you're looking for adventure, you've came to the right place. Situated on the far southern border of Indiana, it's incredibly hilly, scenic, and one of the most wild and untamed places in the state. With over 308 square miles, you will run out of time before you run out of things to see. As you drive through the county, there are hundreds of feet of limestone below you, and in that, hundreds of caves. Many are known, and some are waiting to be found. One of the most extraordinary is Wyandotte Caves. Actually two separate caves, the larger or big Wyandotte Cave was discovered and explored around 1798. By 1810, it was mined for saltpeter to make gunpowder, and in 1815, magnesium sulfate, or Epsom salts, the same mineral that people use to soak their aching feet and bodies to this day. Indiana Territory Governor and future President William Henry Harrison also used it to hide military supplies at one point. The saltpeter found for gunpowder was used in the War of 1812 as we fought the British. In 1850, the cave was made into a tourist attraction, making it the fourth oldest commercial cave in the United States. In 1878, it was explored and described by legendary geologist Edward Travers Cox, bringing to light huge passages and otherworldly formations of immense size. He was the same man whom investigated stone fortifications, earthworks, and mounds made by ancient people throughout Indiana, and this place would only further his reputation in that regard. To the south is Little Wyandotte, and to the north, Big Wyandotte. They are not connected at all, and are very different. Aside for a few stairs going down, Little Wyandotte is a 30 to 45 minute tour, and not very strenuous. It was discovered much later than Big Wyandotte, in 1851. The doors allow ventilation and for bats to enter and exit if they want to, but only a few ever venture in. You'll notice a small shack to the north of Little Wyandotte. This is where visitors are outfitted with cave helmets and headlamps to explore Big Wyandotte Cave. You'll need both as this tour gives you a taste of what wild Indiana caves are like. Be advised, this tour takes you one and a half miles underground and is two hours in total. If you're not in good physical shape, this cave tour is not for you. But if you are, this large cave will thrill you like no other. Starting from a relatively small opening, it expands into a huge, underground, enchanted world. 
Deep inside the cave, ancient people used grapevines and hickory bark for torches as they mined for valuable resources. Radiocarbon dating suggests that they were here a little more than 10,000 years ago. They mined the cave for aragonite to make various kinds of jewelry and pipes, and chert to make both tools and weapons. These items were traded extensively. This type of chert is not found anywhere else on earth and is known as Wyandotte chert. Some of these chert items were found on the east coast, proving that they had a vast trading network, one that went hundreds of miles. Among other valuable minerals, the cave also has rare helictites. Extremely fragile, they seem to defy the laws of gravity, unlike other formations that develop by water dripping down and making relatively straight deposits. These form in all kinds of angles. Also in the cave is an odd fellow's meeting hall. Similar to Masonic lodges, members once gathered here in secret to carry out initiations, ceremonies, and rites. But the highlight of the tour is Monument Mountain. It's considered one of the tallest underground mountains in the world. Be advised that you will have to climb it to exit the cave. It's breathtaking in more ways than one. For eight years, between 2009 and 2016, the cave was closed to prevent the spread of white nose syndrome, a disease that killed thousands of bats. It was closed again in 2022 to study a bat species found in the cave. Hopefully, in 2023, it will be open for tours again. Cave tours can be arranged by contacting the office at O'Bannon Woods State Park. Each year, the caves are closed from fall to spring as over 30,000 bats use Big Wyandotte to hibernate. North of Wyandotte is Milltown, Indiana, founded in 1839. Once a thriving town, it now has a slower pace but has never lost its charm. Its main attraction is Cave Country Canoes. It attracts visitors from all over the country and the globe. Both kayak and canoe adventures are offered here, from a few hours up to all day events. Starting at the bridge, the water takes you along the peaceful Blue River an absolutely beautiful country. You can find freshwater clams along the shore that Native Americans used to make jewelry. Along the river is a ton of quiet serenity. You'll see a great deal of wildlife in many caves that were once used by Indians and ancient people before them. Do note that these caves are on private property. South of town is the famous shoe tree where people come to throw old shoes up into the branches as a rite of passage. This has been going on for generations and what started as a single shoe tree is now many. The number of shoes is overwhelming and by the hundreds. Looking up, it's hard to imagine how some of them made it to the top. Maybe you too, or even your entire family, can be part of the tradition. Northwest of Milltown is the town of Marengo, the town is situated on a large bedrock of limestone. A good example of this is the Marengo Warehouse Distribution Center. The facility has over 3 million square feet underground 
with 13 separate warehouses and many more planned, it is humongous. It could easily function as a doomsday shelter. There's even a cave in the center of town called City Cave. While gated to prevent accidents, tours are conducted on a regular basis. But the biggest attraction at Morango is Morango Cave Park. It is truly one of the most beautiful caves on earth and well worth a visit. It was discovered in 1883 by a sister and brother and soon opened as a tourist attraction. Here you'll find two beautiful and amazing cave tours, two gift shops, and numerous other fun activities. While not handicap accessible, both tours are relatively easy and have few stairs or hills to climb. The Crystal Palace tour is around 40 minutes long and absolutely jam-packed with beautiful formations. While amazing to everyone, it's a great cave for beginners. The tour begins at Mirror Lake and continues to awe visitors until the very end. While this looks very deep, it's only a few inches, and what you see is a reflection of the walls and ceiling. The Dripstone Tour, seen in green, is around an hour. It's nothing short of an underground wonderland and magical in every way. In fact, many people will try the Crystal Palace Tour and immediately buy a Dripstone Trail Tour, and they aren't sorry. Starting at an entrance a short distance from the gift shop, you are immersed in pure wonder. A highlight of the tour is the penny ceiling. Any change you toss at the ceiling sticks. If you look closely, you'll even see a cell phone. Without hesitation, if you're coming to southern Indiana, you must see Marengo Cave. West of Marengo is Tazewell, and one mile south of Indiana 64 on South Trestle Road is a free but amazing attraction known as the Yellow Birch Ravine. It's an ancient rocky ravine where ancient people lived in paradise. Here you'll find numerous caves, rock shelters, waterfalls, and huge rock formations frozen in time. You'll also find a rare Indiana stone arch. On the west side of the road with the parking lot, you'll follow a trail along the stream While not incredibly rugged, 
you will have to cross a few streams to get to the end of the ravine. Waterproof boots are highly recommended. Otherwise, plan on getting wet and muddy. It should go without saying that if it's recently rained, it will be much wetter and muddier. As you walk, scan the sides of the canyon for caves and waterfalls, such as this one on the right side of the trail. It's both a waterfall and a rock shelter. Side. Looking towards the waterfall, if you turn your head left, you'll see a hidden escape that leads out of the ravine. Further along the trail, on the right, and high up on the ravine, is a cave. It's easy to imagine people thousands of years ago, living in this place. Continuing down the trail leads to more remarkable surprises, including this rock shelter. And at the end, this beautiful twin waterfall From here to the parking lot is a steady 27 minute walk. I guarantee you'll want to see what's on the other side of the road. Crossing water many times is also a requirement here. I'll say it again, waterproof boots are a good idea. The trail starts off flat and dry, but will require crossing numerous spots along the creek. As much as you can, stay on the right side of the ravine and take the slate creek bed if you can. It's often dry and an easier walk. You'll start to see gigantic rock formations. And if you look very closely, numerous caves near the top of these ancient places. Many are very hard to get to unless it's dry and you have mountain goat like skills. To say the least, use some common sense as if your life depends on it. It certainly does. The first large ravine on the right has the remnants of a broken arch it's a fairly rugged hike up. If you're pressed for time, skip ahead to the next one. If you follow the water up the ravine, you will find something amazing. In the distance is a huge, rare Indiana arch, locally known as the Tazewell Arch. It is absolutely massive. Right before the arch and to the right is a cave. If 
the ground is wet, reaching it may be a challenge, but it's way easier than many of the others. If you bring a flashlight, take a peek inside, but do not explore any wild cave without training, equipment, and at least one other such person. Some Indiana caves have a sudden drop of 30 or more feet and could be fatal. A certain amount of caution is a requirement to stay alive in this beautiful but often inhospitable landscape. If you found the Yellow Birch Ravine incredible, you will love the secluded and primordial beauty of the Hemlock Cliffs area that's just southeast. The parking lot is much bigger and so is the trail. Plan on staying here several hours and bring water. To be blunt, there are numerous ways to die on this trail as there are many sudden drops. It's more physically demanding than the Yellow Birch Ravine. You will climb down into a secluded ravine and at the end, you will have to climb out. If you're worn out at the end, it's going to be tough. The loop is 1.2 miles, but rest assured, you will get a workout, especially if you climb to see a cave or rock shelter. The first descent between two rock walls is often wet and in winter is ice covered. Take your time. This is only the start of a vast Eden, one that will unfold gracefully over the next two hours. The canyon will converge at a huge rock wedge and waterfall. Ferns and other exotic plants are everywhere in season. Hidden caves are everywhere, both close to the ground and above. Water is plentiful as everything drains to the bottom of the ravine.
Such incredible beauty is everywhere you look. And near the end, one of the largest rock shelters in the county. There are hidden places to explore on every rock base. Some have indentions where metal was leached out over time. There are rock shelters all around the ravine used by ancient people thousands of years ago and much later by Native Americans as well. Artifacts have been found here in numerous other places across Crawford County. If you have time, just sit and meditate on what it must have been like. You'll walk away with a certain peace. When you see the stairs, that's all that's separating you from the parking area. If it seems tough, like anything else in life, pace yourself. A day here, walking among this ancient paradise, will change you. If you get back on 64 West and turn off at St. Croix, going east on 62 will take you to an ancient but very accessible place, the Potts Creek Rock Shelter. Numerous ancient artifacts have been found here and studied, indicating that it was used for many centuries. It is not marked and is easy to miss. Be looking for a large but unmarked pull-off on the left side of the road. You'll then need to walk across the road to see it. You'll also need to cross the creek. Potts Creek will certainly take you there. And if you have time, there's many things to see. You might spot a cave above the ridge line. Any low space is a good place to cross. However, if you're in a hurry and it's daffodil season, usually March in Indiana, there's an incredibly easy way to find the rock shelter. Cross the creek east of the bridge and look for the yellow daffodils. Just beyond the daffodils is the rock shelter. Usually, there's only a trickle of a waterfall, but if a good rain has fallen, it will be gushing over the top. Don't just find the rock shelter and check it off your list. Take a few moments to breathe and experience the spiritual history of this place. A time without cell phones, offices, deadlines, meetings, or future plans. 
living among family and friends for the day. Part of the beauty of Crawford County are the relics of the past. Hidden along the back roads are ruins and ghost towns waiting for you to discover, such as the Fredonia Courthouse. From 1821 to 1846, this was the county seat and courthouse for Crawford County. The county seat was then moved to Leavenworth and then English, where it resides today. But once upon a time, if you had a dispute about land, property, needed to get a marriage license, or were on trial for a crime, this is where you would go. Behind these bricks, a judge sat and listened to cases. People nervously waited for outcomes, ones that seemed so important at the time. Now, all those people are gone, and their names mostly forgotten. But the solid foundation of law brought order to an evolving civilization and provided structure for a county of citizens. And even though most of what happened here is long forgotten, what was started here has remained and was built upon, moving away from chaos and lawlessness a place of peace was created, one that generations have been proud to call home. A little off the beaten path is a pull off at Cape Sandy. It is by far one of the most beautiful views of the Ohio River. Just behind this sign is a divine look above a majestic landscape, one that not many people know about unless they live here. You can see for miles, it seems, a timeless place where unknown people, perhaps even those of the ancient past, have paused for a moment to drink the sweet taste of beauty. Waters have flowed here for eons shaping the edges of the shoreline and bringing rejuvenating waters to fertile lands from places far away. And sometimes, a pleasant view is like medicine to the soul. East of Cape Sandy is the most well-known vista along the Ohio River, the Horseshoe Bend, or Oxbow, that sits in front of the Overlook Restaurant. The view here is nothing short of amazing and completely unforgettable. Just east of the Overlook is Stevenson's General Store, packed with items for the road and a lot of nostalgia from the past. Leavenworth was established in 1814, two years before Indiana was even a state. It was part of the Indiana Territory, with Vincennes as the capital. The town was established by two brothers, Seth and Zebulon Leavenworth. It was a major port for steamboats along the Ohio River. It even had a stagecoach route directly to Indianapolis after Indy became the state capital. The thriving city of Leavenworth served as the county seat of Crawford County from 1843 to 1896.
However, all that's left of the original is a ghost town. In 1937, a huge flood overwhelmed the Ohio River, engulfing entire towns, sweeping buildings off their foundations and floating them away. Others were so badly damaged that they had to be torn down. Very few original buildings remain. The government offered to move the people to higher ground, and most took the offer, making the city abandoned. Today, there are very few full-time residents where the city once was. Heading further east along the river leads us to the Lock and Dam 44 ruins. From a distance, it looks like an abandoned mansion, surrounded by years of neglect. When modern locks and dams were installed along the Ohio River, the old ones were blown up, along with the pump house buildings. This is only one of two that still exist in Indiana. The other one is at Newburgh, near Evansville. Inside are the remains of a once proud structure, with years of graffiti and vandalism bestowed upon this monument of the past. Everything changes, that's a given. But the river, it keeps flowing in one direction. Sometimes high, sometimes low, but always maintaining its resolve and purpose. Somewhere in there, along the journey, are some excellent lessons for the soul. That is... If a person cares to get their feet wet, waiting in a moment of reflection. From ancient people, hidden paradises, underground worlds, and ruins from another time, Crawford County is truly a remarkable stop on any journey to southern Indiana. And maybe that stop is just down the road for you.